something and hopefully it will give you some historical perspective on why things are the way they are and how we got here. So um, here is where I was when I started my career uh, at the Naval and Sea Center, uh, which has changed its name a lot since then. But on July 1976, when I was first hired by the U.S. Navy, engineer, I was a sound engineer. Uh, in 1976, TCP 
CIP was still being developed, the paper from Vincent and Bob Kahn had just come out. This was the era of Unix version 6, and it had just come out the year before, and so it was before BSD and any of the other variants. There were no domain names, no domain name system, no DNS. There was no email, there was no Ethernet, nothing was open source. Actually, there was no source available at all. It was all proprietary, and the uh, vendors of the mainframe and other computers held on to that very closely. They did not want you looking at the source code. So it's hard to understand what was really going on inside, other than what was in the documentation and just experience. There was no internet, there was no web, there was no social media, that all came later, and no cell phones, and on and on and on. That's, that's what it was like back 42 years ago when I started. The computing culture in 1976 was, there was a growing frustration with this called the, the mainframe priesthood, because the people that ran the big mainframes was almost like a priesthood, in that they totally controlled the machine and kept the users as far away as, as possible. So you could not influence how things were run on computers, uh, you didn't control how fast things were turned around, and so users weren't more control and access. To give you an idea of what it was like, uh, this was the era where everything was punch cards, mostly, and so you submitted your programs on punch cards across what was called a submittal desk. It was a window where you handed your card deck to someone on the other side, and they would log it in, and they would take it and add it to the stack of other computers that needed to be run. And eventually, it would get loaded into the computer, it would run, your results would send be sent to a printer, and then the output along the original card deck is handed to you. And so the typical turnaround was about two hours. And so Professor was up when I was in university trying to learn how to do programming through software development. It was, we spent a lot of time with the IBM Bull 29 key punch. They would take your cards to this little desk. You look at the chalkboard and play what the turnaround time is. Of course, it got worse and worse and worse later in the, um, in the quarter. And then after two hours, after you waited around, you would get results back. You would sit down and go line by line, correct all the compilation errors, retype uh, in uh, new cars, submit again, and then go round, round, round. So that was turnaround time. It was very slow, a very different software development process. And sometimes you, you would ask, can I can you just put me in the front of the queue? I've got a deadline. I really need to get this done. And there was no mercy. And so there was a desire to get more control. And uh, many computers were starting to appear, and of course, microcomputers. And so that was getting people excited. So in 1975, there was what's called Computer Live and Dream Machines, which talk a lot about what we could do if we had more control of the environment. And it kind of talk about the new mini computers that were coming out, the new operating systems that were becoming available, the microcomputers, new concepts that people were thinking about, and um, so there was the notion of let's, let's have this liberation movement from getting out of the old computer era into the new computer era, and dream machines were just sort of dreaming what is the art of the possible. There was a lot of graphics and different ways of looking and programming uh, the computers, and there were even things envisioned like hypertext. So even though the web came later, you thought that's when hypertext was invented, that's when we got HTTP, HTML, and so forth. The concepts were already there in 1975 and 475. And so here's a couple of references out of the, uh, that particular book on what hypertext is and everything being deeply intertwined. They had thought about it, it was developed. It's just an HTML and HTTP had to develop it for them. Um, I actually have my copy of Computer Lit and Dream Machines signed by the author. I met in 1975, and sure enough, on page 24, I think it is, you can read all about hypertext and various other concepts. So, if you want to look at that, you can do that later. So, there were a lot of things that people wanted to try to do if they could just get more control of the machine. So, that's where some of the newer operating systems got very exciting because the context was an environment where you didn't have much control of the system and uh, you just want more access. Also in 1976, the standard networking, at least from what I saw, was the art of it. Now, the university had had no exposure to this. It wasn't until 
after I started with the Navy, that they happened to have an army that goes there. And they really weren't doing much with it. And so part of my first job was figure out how to get the army that talked for a unit back because that was the purpose that they bought. But there was really nobody working on it. So I got involved in uh, the ARPANET right away. Uh, the previous person who was responsible for it says, okay, it's, it's now your responsibility. You can be the known site coordinator and deal with all the politics and everything else and keeping it running. And so I had note number three from the ARPANET. Now, note number three was originally at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, but it was for some reason moved down to our place. I don't know why it predated me. But, so we didn't have like the third computer on the ARPANET, but we did have note number three. So, uh, want to move. So the protocol then is predated to CPI, it was called NCP, you know, control program. Addresses were eight bits. There were two bits for the host part, six bits for the in no, in the late 1980s you got four BSD and not today at all. So obviously that is not near enough address space. So my name was node number three and the address separator was the slash. Remember in IPv4, the separator is a dot, and IPv6 is a colon, but in NCP it was a slash. So since my connection was to node number three, and I was close to number zero, uh, my address was zero slash three, and they had a shorthand notation, you could skip to zero and you could do three. So if you wanted to connect to my site, the way you told it to connect inside Telnet or, or on the, the tip, which was the, the way to hook a teletype to the M, you could just say app three and connect to my site. It's as simple as that. So my address was three on the carbon. Later, when TCPIP was born and we started running TCPIP, the carbon was never done. And so we became 10.0.0.3. This was a class A address, and there was no cider in those days. And so everything was class A, B, or C. And later, when the carbon was disbanded, as you know, and was unused and it became part of our RC1918 space. So uh, I used to tell people, like, we used to be network 10, you know, there was zero three, and they said, no, 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 that doesn't make sense. The ARPANET didn't run privacy addresses. Well, no, it didn't, because um, the uh, 10 of zero, zero average space was later converted after the ARPANET went away. How you connected to the unit was the BDN 1822 protocol. It was a whole book that described it. It was very rudimentary. Uh, painful to program, had a lot of bugs, a lot of issues with flow control. You lose sometimes the messages that handle the flow control and you get into these deadlock situations. And so there was a lot of work to try to improve that. But there were three types, three ways to connect LHDH or VDH, which stood for local host, distant host, or very distant host. <laughs> LH basically meant inside the room. DH meant probably inside the building, maybe the neighboring buildings on campus. And VDH was really a way to extend that over some kind of modern protocol uh, to a road that's going to be somewhere far away. So uh, we typically connected to uh, VDH just because it was convenient to make sure we our folks anywhere. Uh, the circuits between the ends were 50 kilobit wideband modems, uh, analog modems. There was no digital modems. And these things were big. They fit in a 24 inch wide rack. And that, a modem was about that size. It had all this analog stuff in it. And you could fit two of them in a, in a pretty large rack. So if you happen to have three connections, one of them are going to back up rack. So sometimes a lot of space just to hold all the modems. And, and that's a picture of the uh, original um, Honeywell Inn. So in about 2012, John George, who's shown us his picture, he's someone I had met, he's from Slovenia. I met him uh, at an early Google IPv6 conference, uh, probably in the mid-2000s. And um, we got to know each other, and at some point I must have mentioned to him that I had EM number three, and I may have suggested that I kept some of the parts from that EM from the um, early ARPANET days, and a few other things. And so he was coming to San Diego for a conference in Slovenia, and he called me up ahead of time and says, hey, could you come down some evening for the conference and maybe bring along some of those things you told me about? So uh, when we got to work, I grabbed a bunch of stuff and we met in the bar at the hotel conference and uh, brought along one panel of hit number three. And there was much excitement about that. In fact, it drew quite a crowd. Everybody had to take pictures. So they were standing inside the end which is the, the greatest thing. And I had no idea this thing had been sitting on my desk for 30 years. And, uh, <laughs> 
interesting to hear about something called Unix. I had never heard about this in university. It wasn't until we started playing with the ARPANET and playing with the ALF and trying to figure out how we're going to the Unibac computer. And we heard about Unix. And so, first thing we found out trying to get Unix it was expensive. And $20,000 back in 1977, 78, when we were trying to do this, that was a lot of money. So it took a lot of justifying the management of why we're not just doing a useful thing like getting software from Univac or IBM. Why are we going to Bell Laboratories to buy this operating system? Aren't there other plenty of operating systems out there? But we convinced them, and eventually there's one of our letters from Bell Laboratories saying, uh, here is your copy of version 6 Unix, and here is it's, what we're including is your 9-track tape and some documentation. And at the very end, it says, oh, we also are enclosed a copy of the special edition of the Bell Systems Technical Journal for Unix. I still have my copy. So that's what, one of the things that came along. Oh, that's the case drive, or that's the disk drive, or whatever. 
So you have to configure all that, and then you uh, configure it, and you set up Google. Yeah. Now, I have a, a challenge story. Uh, we, in those days, we had disk crashes and, and head crashes and so forth, and so every once in a while, you just lose your disk, and sometimes it would take a day to get prepared if the uh, main people had to come out and replace heads, and then you'd have to restore the disk pack uh, from a new disk pack from uh, the backup case. And so then there was a bunch of downtime. So we thought, well, is there a way to get one on just floppy drives? And um, that would be a real tight squeeze to get a whole unit running on just a couple of floppy drives. And so, but we said, if we can get this to work, that's going to be a great backup scenario because we can have these floppies ready, the disk crashes, plug in the few floppies, get the boot, boot them up. And if we can be on the market end, that would be really cool. So we can keep the unit back machine connected and, and not have a day or two of downtime. So I got my two eight <laughs> floppies. And most people that heard floppy drives think of the uh, five inch and three and a quarter or some of those. It's like, why do they call them floppy? These things are stiff. Well, they're floppy because when they were eight inch, they're floppy. <laughs> And what we did in order to get it to fit, see, they're, they're only 256 k each, okay? And so we had to basically strip down Unix to the absolute minimum essential. It was uh, only a root file system, and about the only thing that had on it was a NIT and a couple other things. And we used one for root and one for swap. And it was interesting, that thing moved up, it was clicking, 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 clicking. It was really interesting to listen to, but it worked. Uh, the other thing we had to do is we had to totally rewrite the RX driver, that's the floppy disk driver, because it was not optimized to know the rotational speed of the floppy disk, <laughs> and so it was always missing the sector. And so we totally rewrote it, so it always positioned everything and knew exactly what was the absolute fastest that it could read off the disk, and it got rid of a lot of clicking and so forth. So we succeeded in doing that, we were very excited to be able to do that. Um, and we could basically keep Telnet and Telnet running so the Univac computer could be connected to the ARPANET on two floppies with Unix. And it had a TCP stack in it too, and the Telnet server. Okay, so that was our challenge and we asked to succeed. So, that's fun. so why do we think Unix was so cool? It came with source code. Everything else we dealt with before had no source code. We couldn't get it, it was proprietary. Only the, the companies, Univac, IBM, would get the look source code. Here you could actually read the source code from the kernel and understand it. And I mean, it was a very exciting bit of my reading. I'm serious, it really was, because it was a very clean code. Um, all the studies in the university that I had, uh, told us about operating systems. We had to take an entire year learning about operating systems. We had to write our own operating systems on part of the of course. And it had to work, it had to move, and so we had to run. Uh, so we knew about operating systems. Here was a case where you actually could look at the source code of a good operating system, learn about it, see how it all worked. Very exciting. And what you could do, I mean, you could learn a lot of C programming techniques from doing that. Uh, Ken Thompson was a really good C programmer, and his code was very tight, a lot of tricks that you might not see other places. So it was, it was very good reading. You could enhance it because you had the source code, you could augment it like that networking. So it gave you a bunch of capabilities you didn't have before. You were no longer hostage to the vendor or to the um, mainframe piece of it. It had a hierarchical file system that was simple to understand and use. Did you ever try to use some of the IBM file systems or your like file systems? I mean, DASD and JCL and all the crazy stuff. Very complex. Never could get to figure it out. But here was a hierarchical file system that was simple and understandable, easy to use. It had this thing called the set new ID bin. Never saw that before. So cool. And then it had a shell uh, and simple commands that could interconnect with pipes. We'd never seen that before. And so it just it kind of revolutionized how we thought about what the computer operating system should look like when what we were used to was IBM and Univac and maybe some of the original um, deck operating systems. So here was where we were. This is just to set some context for the time frame. So I started in 1976. Version 6 had just come out of Unix. There was another thing called PWB Unix, which we were excited about because uh, for programmers in the software development environment, uh, there were a bunch of tools, but what was really key was RJE. RJE stands for Remote Job Entry. So it's 
So in the mainframe era, RJE was a very typical way that you could have a remote card reader and printer connected to your mainframe because all your remote sites couldn't afford to have a remote computer. So they would have a remote job entry, a place where you could put in your cards and get your printouts back. And so thinking that, oh, Unix could support the RJD environment and, and send in batch jobs that way, that would be very cool. And then had um, SCCS with the control system. They had Make, a lot of good programming tools um, to help, help the program. So we were excited about the RJD Unix and played with that quite a bit. In fact, I think, yeah, I have my PWB Unix paint. Now this one is dated uh, 1980. I kept this in my office. This is my backup tape. And so I, the, the, the random process or something, and so I do have my PWB Unix tape. So we did a lot of PWB Unix. And then 79, 7th edition came out, we had Born Shell, Octar, UCT, and a whole lot more. Um, I'll let you use the story later. And then Unix 3 at the same yes, time, I'm basically sure. the same thing which ran on the back. Now the back was actually was exciting because it was 32 bit instead of 16 bit. So you could average a lot more random space. And it had virtual memory. And so um, those of us that were using PDP 11s and trying to squeeze it into small average space, virtual memory was just awesome. Thinking about that, so we all tried to buy it back. Well, then we heard about this thing called BSD, and by going to Unix and other meetings, uh, people were talking about, hey, do I get a BSD tape? Oh, what's BSD? For um, a software distribution. So we tried it. So we had PDP 11s, so we had two BSD and played with it there. And in later years, we did a, a lot of 2 BSD on PDP 1170s because of some of its um, addressing map and architecture um, and having to use PDP 1170s. Then we got 3 BSD for our DAX 11780. And it was good. Uh, kind of introduced us to the, the whole BSD world. And then uh, this predated send mail. The liver mail was actually pretty neat because we had to route email between ARPANET, UUCP, uh, and some of the other networks, there was a thing called ARPANET. Um, and so the way you would configure all those parameters, you would actually go into the code and modify the sequence to do, a, do what you wanted to do, to do all the routing. And so um, we did that a lot. And so I can understand why SendMail moved all the config stuff into a CF file. Because then you could uh, basically configure your mail system without having to compile it. And so that was nice. And then, <laughs> um, the Curses Library of Curvecast was really handy in terms of the leader for things like VI and so forth if you had a CRT terminal. Until then, we had 33 teletypes, depth writers, and so forth, which were basically hard copy. Now that you know, the MS3 run Unix, 
and there were people in both camps, and the VMS people were kind of winning, saying VMS is much faster. So, um, as I heard it uh, stated, uh, the world <coughs>
to other physical media, and IP packets would be forwarded through routers or through hosts or whatever to another network. And so we can latch all our networks together and create an internet, and that's why it's called the Internet Protocol. And what we would do is we initially got this running, uh, the routing process running in uh, Vax 11750, running BSD, of course. And in order to do the routing protocol locally, you need something like RIP, and so you run RUPD. Or if you were talking to the outside world in the ARPANET, you needed an exterior gateway protocol. And so this predated BGP, so we ran an EGP. Uh, and so I actually ran BGP, ran an EGP, talking to the IMP. And the code was just so buggy, it took me months to get all the bugs worked out. So I published what I call the, the EGP jumbo patch. Um, so you drop in a gate key and then talk reliably to an amp. And uh, of course, you need to file system number, and it was one of the early ones, so I have the PSA number 22. Uh, now they're in bit of a bigger number, so I don't want to small number. <laughs> also, uh, about 84, I think, we installed the internet for the first time, and what we did in those days, we bought the old yellow cable that was 384 feet long, or what the official length was, and you bought vampire caps, so you, you drill a hole, get through these shields, so you touch the center, and then you put a cap on it that touch the center and then to the outside and transmit the phone that has an original Ethernet design. Recently, the picture on the right, we have, were uh, redoing one of our buildings, uh, one of our rooms, cleaning it out, and pulled some stuff away from the wall, and up top there was that old original Ethernet cable still still there from a couple years ago. Did I pick on the wire? There was nothing to it. was just, that used to be connected to a, a batch that was in that room. Now, in those days, uh, in the early days of the ARPANET, uh, there was no ping, uh, but what would be cool is to see how far they might talk across the ARPANET. And if you look back at that map, there's the map, there it is. You see the um, jagged line going to the right and then ending up at London. That was University College London, and they had a, I think it was a 360-195. You could tell that to that thing, and it would give you a login prompt. And so that was very cool. So we would always <laughs> demonstrate the ARPANET by Telnet UCL, and we would be connected to the University of College of London. And people couldn't believe it. It's like, you're really talking to London? How's that possible? Because the idea of an ARPANET or the internet, it was just it was foreign to anybody who wasn't involved with it. So we used to impress our friends. So I would say, hey, what else do you mean that London? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> So how do we take care of learning all the names of all the addresses on the ARPANET? Uh, everything that had an address uh, was kept in what was called a host file, was called host.txt, and it was uh, kept up at uh, SRI NIC, Network Information Center. And you could download it using FTP, and you would save it to the ETC host file. And so when you wanted to connect, you didn't have to remember the IP address. You could just connect to the name, like to um, Berkeley, for example, you know, Berkeley or SRI, NIC, or um, MIT, uh, you said that most of the stuff. That was nicer than having to remember IP addresses. Now, there were some unauthorized versions of the post file that you could download uh, that we used to do because it was, um, it was fun. And uh, some of them had unauthorized names and aliases, and uh, some were, were somewhat humorous. And I, I do remember the alias for Berkeley. Was berserkly. You could send emails to people that Berkeley by so and so at berserk, and that was funny. So after a while, the text file got really big. All the good names were taken. You had to be really creative. And when you have multiple organizations all wanting to call their Vax, Vax, or whatever, um, you had to come up with a new system. And so DNS was born. It was specified in 1983. Vine came out in 84. And of course, we ran it right away. Solve lots of issues. So my email address changed from Ron at NYC FCC, which stands for Naval Open System Center, our new name, at Computer Center, to Ron at NOSC.mil. Um, I have managed to keep that email address working and that domain working all these years. You can still send me email at that email address. <laughs> one of the oldest working email addresses that's still in use today and still works today. <laughs> 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 no, 
Now, in 83, we had our first security incident. Uh, there was a student at UCLA who managed to get into the carpet uh, Before then, it was all professors and researchers, and it was one big happy family, and everybody trusted everybody else. But uh, this kid, a student, got access, and he dialed in his TRS-80, this Radio Shack TRS-80, and managed to break into a whole lot of sites, just by password guessing. Because in those days, if your last name is Smith, your user ID was Smith, your password was Smith. Uh, and so, in a lot of systems, the user ID was guessed, the password was anonymous. And so, it just, you could log in anywhere, and some of them purposely were trying to be open. Some of the MIT machines, they allowed anybody to log in, get in there. It was a research environment, so they wanted to encourage that. But um, after this happened, the world changed. And so there was a newspaper article I got here in front of the newspaper. And um, so it shows the Los Angeles district attorney talking about the student that's going to go to jail. They have confiscated his TRS-80 and his modem from his house. And you can see my organization is right in the San Diego Ocean System Center. So that was our first security incident. And that's how I got involved in cybersecurity. So I've been doing cybersecurity since 1983. And uh, I've been <laughs> So early security references, um, I don't know if you've heard of the Orange Book, but um, I understand a lot of people are not familiar with it. I, I, knew, I found this out when a VIP had come to our site and heard about you know, some early archivists and stuff, and so he wanted to visit my office and talk to me and hear some of the history. And so we were talking about that, we were talking about cybersecurity, and I started referencing things in the Orange Book, and he said, yeah, I heard about that in university. And um, why did they call it the Orange Book? And I said, well, it's covered in orange. We didn't do that because all we had was the PDF. And so... <laughs> And the 
wasn't sure at first how he got in to resolve vulnerability and how he got in. And then we started seeing that he was getting into a lot of other university systems, government systems, and so forth. So we had to track this guy down. We traced where he was coming in across the internet and saw that he was coming from Harvard University. So we went to Harvard and said, somebody at your place is breaking into a lot of different computers. We need to track him down. Can we sniff your network and see who it is? They said, no way. You're not putting a sniff on our network, privacy concerns, lots of concerns. It's like, aren't you interested in helping to find who your hacker is? Uh, nope, not going to let you sniff our network unless you have a court order. So we went and got a court order and found out this had never been done before for a computer network. There was no precedent. It's done for telephone lines all the time, not for a computer network. So this went all the way to the U.S. Attorney General, the highest law enforcement official in the U.S. government. And that was Janet Reno, who was working with President Bill Clinton at the time, and she had to grant the court order so that we could tap the Harvard network. So we went back to Harvard with our court order and had some law enforcement people with me. And part of the rule was we could only track the hacker traffic. So we had to put in filters and sniffers so we would only look for his uh, signature. And we found it. It was coming from the dial-up modem. So then we had to get a track and trace order to look at the dial-ups to see where it was coming from. Managed to figure it out and correlate when it was coming across the Harvard network. It was coming from Argentina. Went to Argentina, somebody had hacked the phone system there and basically was doing free long distance calls. It was happening to computers all over the place. Eventually tracked him down and he was a student, happened to be the son of a high government official. And so that was a, a little bit of challenging trying to get him charged with the crime. But um, he was in Argentine 22, and you can see the headlines. Uh, this case marks the first time federal authorities obtained a court order to monitor private electronic communications. So uh, this eventually turned into a tele television documentary, moving back to Boston, and, and it was from the Marine Channel, and, and had to do um, uh, sort of reconstruct the whole scenario on um, how that all happened. And uh, very interesting, learned a lot about um, what you can believe on TV and the Marine Channel, all those things, because a lot of it's very dramatized and sensationalized. And so I, I, I don't believe much of what I see on television anymore, just because I was through it myself on the other side. Now, we would get broken into from other countries as well, and directly over the Arbonne and the internet. And I can still remember a, uh, a good case of uh, this guy from Taiwan that kept breaking into our computers. And so what I would do, I figured he's breaking into me, I was breaking into him. So it's called hack hack. So I would hack into his machine. I found all his tools, figured out who he was, and that was starting just to be a, a regular way to track down people and shut them out of our network. Until one day I got um, visited by the State Department and I said, um, are you hacking into computers in foreign countries? And do you realize that you're breaking many treaties by doing that? <laughs> <laughs> there was another incident about our dollars and UCP. So in the old days, you couldn't just buy a day's modem and type ATDT and have a dial phone number. didn't exist. What you have to do is on your PDP 11, you would actually wire it up on one of the um, interfaces where you would pulse dial the phone line. I mean, you could do that still today. You could go to your phone and you can tap it and you can actually dial phone numbers by you know, sending the right number of pulses. And so we would do that and uh, over the country. And we wanted to do this, but there was this thing called UUCP, and you could use that to dial up on computers, and then there was this whole UUNET and USENET and other things that were built on top of it. So we really wanted to be participating in that. So it would also get huge phone bills because some of the relay sites, like some of the Bell Lab sites, were on the other coast. IHF before was one of them. Huge phone bills. Um, somewhere in our, somebody in our office got that bill. I'm not sure who, but I, I never got complaints. So we kept doing it. And so we sent mail and we to our UCP. But if your timing wasn't right when you pulse dialed, the computer's back with the human. 
And so if you didn't put enough delays in, sometimes it would miss the first digit, and then it would end up dialing a totally different number. And so um, you'd sometimes get wrong numbers, and we had one case where John went to the East Coast, where it would slip one of the digits, say 50% of the time, it would actually call some poor lady in a neighboring community. She was getting phone calls like every 10 minutes. So 
So maybe we need to flag it for IPv6. We want to get there. So that's the end of my talk. You can reach me still. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have time. Happy to take questions. No time. Or catch me in the hall or at dinner or something like that. Quick question here.